Today on MuggleCast, a trip into the future with the inner eye. But first, let's hear from this week's sponsor, BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. Our chapter-by-chapter reread of the Harry Potter books provides a good example of this. We're getting different things out of the stories than we did 15 to 20 years ago. And many years down the road, once the TV show premieres, we'll probably once again get different messages from the stories. Point is, we're always growing and changing, and interpreting things differently than we did years, months, or even days earlier. Similarly, therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding. Therapy can help you manage your life, anxiety, and any issues as you evolve. A therapist provides you with a place to speak openly and honestly, and your therapist will offer different and new perspectives that can help you get through any issues you may be facing. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Plus, it's entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash MuggleCast today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash MuggleCast. Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing Chapter 6 of Prisoner of Azkaban, Talons and Tea Leaves. Get ready to broaden your minds and see past the mundane. Andrew, I seem to remember you having a better Trelawney I was going to say, thank you for calling that out. What was that weak sauce that I'm you just, just gave us? I'm just getting warmed up. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> you want me to? All right. You want to jump straight into it? Here we go. Yeah. Get ready to broaden ready your to minds broaden. and see past the mundane. <laughs> you about to start a boxing match? I, don't, I was. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> In one corner, Buckbeak the Hippogriff. In the other. Was that the surprise? That is the surprise, yes. I have okay, a live Echo cool. tool now. Oh. <laughs> Just released for Mac this week. That's so cool. Very cool. Yeah. Somebody who's not having a mundane weekend, hopefully, is Eric. It's your birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And you are having a birthday party of sorts on our Instagram live, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. Right after we finished recording this episode, uh, Chloe reached out, said, we're going to do this new thing where the hosts uh, are probably going to do this uh, as long as you guys uh, consent. If today goes well, we'll have one for your birthdays as well. So Andrew, take, <laughs> take note. Uh, Andrew, in about a month, uh, almost exactly, we will uh, hopefully get together around your birthday party around the IG campfire. Uh, but yeah, on IG Live, check that out. By the time this airs, you will have, it will have occurred, um, but it's just going to be a little short kind of Q&A session and hang out, so. And people can watch it in the grid. If they go into the MuggleCast account on Instagram, you'll the see grid. it there. On the yeah. grid. Yeah, yeah on that's the grid. What, that's what the cool kids say, I think. Yeah, so thanks to everyone who comes out for that. We hope you have anything but a mundane weekend. Mm. Thanks. No Grimms. No grim. No grim. Yeah. It could never be mundane because I'm with you guys. Though Aww. I will say, you, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to say though, you might want to like look behind you because uh, I don't know. You you seem like you might be in a little bit of danger there. Oh, that's Beaky. Oh, okay. he's chill. He has a hippogriff in his Zoom background, listeners. Yeah, is a hippogriff about to pounce on Draco? So before we get to the chapter. We have a little bit of news we're just going to touch on for now. A new Quidditch video game is coming soon for consoles. So this is going to be a pretty big video game. We will actually discuss this in Bonus MuggleCast this week, which is available exclusively on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash MuggleCast. Patrons get access to two new Bonus MuggleCast installments each month, plus loads of other benefits, and your support goes to keeping the show running. So we're very grateful. And yeah, we'll we'll hook you up with cool benefits like that. I'm very excited for this game. I, I think this is very promising. And so soon, seemingly, after Hogwarts Legacy. Yeah, I'm stoked for it. This is the one game I have always wished that they would remake is the original classic uh, Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup. And it seems like this game is very similar. So I'm very excited about it. We did a bonus muggle cast last week talking about the Harry Potter TV series. 
and uh, we talked for probably over a half hour, right, about that. So that was a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, 39 minutes in the end. We keep getting news to fuel our bonus muggle casts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good timing with the increase in bonus muggle cast installments. Yeah, it's an exciting time to be a fan, honestly, with so much new content on the horizon. Um, but yeah, we'll chat about that more in bonus today. I'm excited. Yeah, so again, patreon.com slash mugglecast. Thanks, everybody who supports us. And well, without further ado, let's get into chapter by chapter this week. And we'll start, as always, with our seven-word summary. And I believe we selected Eric to kick things off because it is his birthday weekend. Yes, but I will give you guys a choice. Pick one or two. Oh, two. 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 Oh, do I don't have a choice. <laughs> go, go <with laughs> you were already outvoted. <laughs> All right, here we go. McGonagall. Shades. During. Uh, Transfiguration. (laughs) Class. Ooh. (laughs) That's perfect. You can't say that's not a word. No, that's that's perfect. (laughs) That's perfect. This is probably my favorite one of the of the of the book so far. Yeah. 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 I like Andrew's end here because what what would normally happen when somebody throws shade on somebody else, the other people who are around would go, ooh, you know, like. Exactly. "Mm -hmm." I'm kind of surprised that doesn't happen here. Had you guys uh, had you guys picked one? uh, I was going to start with controversy. Uh, so oh, I just couldn't decide. Okay. Was, no, I go either way. I kind of like the direction we took this because yeah. it does kind of foreshadow some themes that we're going to see over the course of this book. So it totally works. But let's start with the beginning of this chapter before we get into the first day of classes. Harry, Ron, and Hermione go down to the Great Hall for breakfast, and Harry is immediately greeted with Malfoy and a few other Slytherins mocking him for fainting due to the Dementor on the Hogwarts Express. Um, We later find out, of course, George, I think one of the twins, comes and confirms, well, hey, actually, Malfoy was pretty scared by the Dementors, too. He came running into, into our compartment um screaming about them so obviously Malfoy is someone who um his his bark is worse than his bite I think he he talks a big game which is pretty in character for him uh Malfoy's a little (laughs) Uh... Eric kicking off the birthday episode I can do what I want I can do what I want I can say what I want like who does he think he is like this is Harry feels bad enough already and this is, I mean, I'm going to be honest, this is like pretty ableist of everyone to be like, oh, Harry had a bad experience, especially because when Fred and George come to sit down at the table, they're like, yeah, he wasn't so, so strong last night, nearly wet himself. Everyone was scared of the Dementors. It's just that it's just an opportunity to make somebody feel bad for having an involuntary um, you know, reflex reaction. And I'm over it. It's uh, you could get away with that in 2004, 1997 or whatever, but not not now. I think, too, at at some point, the joke gets old and it seems like it's just constantly there throughout the course of this book. And I think we've all been in situations where jokes have been told over and over again. And you just want to say, give it up already. Uh, not the jokes we tell on this show, of course, over the years. No, Th- they those are totally die. fine. But <laughs> it's like if we would bring the same thing up every week, it would get old after a while. And I think Draco is just milking this for all it's worth. Mm-hmm. Did any of us ever have an experience like this in school where something either embarrassing or maybe even like low key traumatic happened <laughs> that people, peers kept bringing up? as a joke over time uh all my experiences are high key traumatic so i will not be sharing them (laughs) Uh, but but this is fair this is very this is very accurate this this is despite you know my being over malfoy's behavior it's 100 percent very much like it was in school um they don't Nobody needs a reason. That's the important thing is like if somebody's going to bully you, they're going to come up with something. It's not like Harry could have prevented this thing. It just would have been something else uh, that Malfoy would have would have glommed onto. Yeah. Do, 
do we feel like this is the first time that Draco has really had something to go after Harry for? Because if I'm thinking back to other books, a lot of times his targets have been Ron or Hermione. Now he he can really use the fainting spell as something he can go after Harry for. Yeah, it's a weakness. Yes. Yeah. Right? And he's threatened mm. by Harry, especially after Harry kicked his butt in the one and only Quidditch match they've played against each other so far. And discredited his father at the end right. of last year. Um, this is just a really natural escalation between the two of them for, for Draco to be outwardly targeting Harry this year. It feels like a good natural move that he would take for being the little pissant that he is. Well, he gets his comeuppance a little bit later on in the chapter, but we're going to dive right into divination. And as we do that, I wanted to connect the threads here quickly. Um, We meet Professor Trelawney, who's the professor of divination. And we're later going to learn that she made the prophecy about Voldemort and, you know, potentially Harry slash Neville, depending on Voldemort's choice. And I thought based on that, we could take a look of some of the at some of the predictions that Trelawney makes in this chapter and try to decide whether or not she was right about them. I think throughout the books, we're led to believe that she was only right like twice in her predictions. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought we could look at some of the predictions that she makes in this first divination class and see if she was right about any of them. One of the first ones was uh, Neville's grandmother potentially not being well. She says to Neville, you know, you boy, is your grandmother well? And he's like, I I think so. And she says, well, I wouldn't be so sure. (laughs) Which like (laughs) freakish thing to say to a child. Um, I wanted to talk about this one first. I feel like this is wrong. (laughs) I don't know where (laughs) she's getting this from. Yeah. So if we try to read deeply into this. I wonder if she could have meant mentally unwell in (laughs) that maybe I don't mean it like as a joke, just like she's got a lot of anxiety, maybe still grieving the loss of her kids. Alternatively, maybe it's just an inaccurate reading and it's Neville's mother and father who weren't well. And that could make sense thinking about the tragic state that they're permanently in. I know I'm reaching here, but I really like Trelawney and some of these predictions end up being true. So. I want to believe she was kind of on the right track here. <laughs> so well, you're, you're really becoming a Trelawney apologist. Just I like know. A oh my God. Uh, mm. I didn't know that about you, Andrew. We need a new graphic. <laughs> I like this reading into it. I also think maybe this is one of the first instances where we can just look at Trelawney as throwing out potential predictions or, you know, um, prophecy. It's This isn't a prophecy. This is more of just... Let me see. What do I know about Neville? Maybe I went right. to school with his grandmother. You know, like I can throw her name out there and I'll sound like I know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. This is a very easy kind of thing for if you want to show this is all a grift. This is exactly what Trelawney is doing, faking it till she makes it. She wants to lay out just the most crazy assortment of vague enough, uh, but specific enough seeming things that eventually come true so that her teachers or her students, her pupils are in awe of her. Um, Neville's gran is probably up in age a little bit. Uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that she has one or two health issues, even just physically, maybe arthritis, maybe, you know, who knows? (laughs) Like once you get up in age, you begin to have health issues. That yeah, happened. She, she, didn't yeah. she get after it in the Battle of Hogwarts, though? I thought oh, she, she was crashed. out there. Got it, oh, yeah. I mean, ab- well, maybe she saying... starts training in the build up <laughs> to, the, to the fight. <laughs> but she knows it's I, coming. Going off of what you were talking about, Andrew, though, too, let's not forget how she treats Neville. So you could maybe, you know, infer on what Trelawney is saying here as her being unwell because of the treatment of her grandson. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And she also does address Neville as boy, so she doesn't really know who Neville is, it seems. That's true. Although he gets a lot of crap in this chapter. Yeah, Neville really, I really feel bad for Neville. Um, And it's the thing with the teacups, almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, well, we can jump ahead to that since we're talking about Neville. Um, So you tell a kid with a nervous disorder who's probably (laughs) should be like on medication 
that uh, it, it's not even an option. Don't even like, don't try and break the, the teacup. Once you've broken your first teacup, take the ones I like a little less. Like, he, Neville has no choice in the matter. He's going to get up and he's going to screw up and mess, a, mess up a teacup. It's just going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Like you said, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I, I don't think we can call this one true just because it, it, it was Trelawney stressing him out in all likelihood. It's technically true. But when it's right, sort of on a technicality, I agree. I don't think we count it. Well, how did she stack the teacups, too? There's no easy way. They're probably, you know, <laughs> there's they probably fall and break on their own hmm. like any moment. Yeah. Has she heard of Reparo? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a method of stacking teacups? Well, if they break, you can fix them. Oh, yeah. repair. Oh, Reparo. OK, I was yeah, like, sorry. I added a little Micah's fancy. That's cool. Yeah, I don't know why I said it that way, but I did. Anyway, no, that's, I think that's, that's cool. how that's our cool. characters are saying it in Hogwarts Legacy, right? They're like, oh, maybe Reparo. that's what it is. I've been imprinted on by H- Hogwarts Legacy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, she also calls out, you know, there's going to be a nasty flu in February. Duh. It's February. <laughs> it's flu season. Yeah. Well, this is the one that doesn't. I don't remember this coming true. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. We'll have to see when we get to February. It'd be really easy, but I like for for the author to be have been like, oh yeah, people were sniffling a little bit more, but <laughs> that would have been funny. She also tells Parvati to beware of the red haired man, which causes Parvati to scoot as far away from Ron as she can. Um, I guess Ron is the only red haired man in this class at the moment, which in feels Hogwarts? weird because <laughs> well, I, yeah, that's I not like, true <laughs> because there are more Weasleys. Yeah. And I feel like there are, there are probably a lot more red haired people just based on the population that we know is attending Hogwarts at this time. What the Irish. Yeah. But also just like a lot of white people. <laughs> like there's going to be red haired people. We know that Parvati does have a twin. And so if we're to believe that what Trelawney is saying is true, could she be mistaking Parvati for Padma, who we know goes to the Yule Ball with Ron and has a pretty awful time? I was reading through this chapter with Meg and Meg said regarding this specific uh, prophecy, although Ron doesn't directly harm Parvati, he does no great favors for her sister, Padma, uh, with the Yule Ball, and also no great favors for Parvati's best friend, Lavender Brown. So maybe in this case, the beware of a red-haired man is just like, a red-haired man is not going to be any good for you or your friends. Um, and it's yeah. kind of more of like that general type thing. Yeah, I mean, those are the two most important women in her life, right? Her sister and her best friend, so... I, I I like it. I like the reading. Um, we also got a prediction that around Easter, one of our number will leave us forever. We know that ends <laughs> up being Hermione. Are, are we going to call this true? Or do we think that um, around Easter, Trelawney has a trend of pissing one of her students off enough that they just get up and leave? I'm surprised <laughs> Hermione holds out that long. Me that too. Seems like a, that seems like a far out, like a long time away, given the already uh, building confrontation between them. Yeah, I'll I'll accept this one as true and authentic. Yeah. I mean, she probably if 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 Hermione hadn't had her scene, she probably would have taken the lowest performing student and kicked them out and <laughs> been like, sorry, we, you're just not good at it and you got to go. Maybe that's what she does. Maybe she expels a student from her class every year who just doesn't have the sight. And that's what she uses <laughs> as her prediction that one of our number will leave us forever. Uh, yeah. She also tells Lavender that the thing that she's dreading will come to pass. Technically, this happens. Lavender's bunny Mm. dies. She gives Mm. Lavender an exact date, too. I don't recall if the bunny dies on that exact date. No, no. What it is is famously, Lavender finds out about it on that day, and so Hermione is able to deconstruct it and be like, actually, it didn't happen. You only found out about it. And then everybody's like, Hermione, you're like being being too mean about this. (laughs) Yeah. It kind of reminds me of like, Long Island Medium or any of those medium type shows Miss Cleo. where somebody's in a studio audience being like, okay, I'm getting the letter M and <laughs> I'm also seeing 
great trauma. Like you're going to find somebody inevitably in that audience who has a loose connection to the things you're bringing up. And you're talking to a 13 year old. I promise you a 13 year old girl is dreading something. Probably more than one thing. (laughs) Right, right. You will be happy on a day that ends in Y. Just like all these super (laughs) vague, you know, people can take these uh, predictions and apply them to a lot of things because they are so vague. This is how I feel about fortune tellers and astrology. I know some people really believe in it and reading into it all. And that's fine. If you, if you want that for yourself, that's great. But I've just never looked at one of these readings, these daily readings you get in the newspaper or wherever else and like taking them seriously because they're always so vague. Well, let, let's jump ahead a little bit on that note. Have any of us ever seen a fortune teller or a tarot card reader or something similar to that? I've had uh, my tarot cards read a couple of times in the past. Have you found these readings to be beneficial, accurate? So what I learned about tarot card reading, and I mean, it could just be the person I spoke with, Andrew, we actually had um, someone come on and read our tarot cards on Millennial around Halloween a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, I forgot about it, that. It's not so much about demystifying the future or making predictions it's about finding connections between what you're currently experiencing in life and the cards and kind of using that to help sift through your thoughts and feelings on the matter and like what could come to pass depending on the choices that you make so i feel like tarot gets a reputation as being like uh, the same as seeing a psychic. And I don't think it is, but listeners feel free to write in and correct me if I'm wrong on that. So I will say personally, I don't think it did anything for me, but I think it does do good for other people. So, you know, if if it works for you, then that's all good. Yeah, it's something to lean on. I kind of see it as spirituality. I I really like that it's a subject at Hogwarts. I think despite uh, our misgivings about the teacher that teaches it, uh, you know, divination as a subject is really interesting because it is about these energies that are in the universe. So it makes sense that in the magical community, there would be a magical way of studying it uh, or harnessing it, or it would seem more legitimate uh, from from basically a person's perspective who can use magic and tap into the universe in that way. So no issues there. All the times I've gone to a psychic or or I think there was one at like my company picnic a few years ago at a work event, which is the <laughs> craziest time to actually go for like a life psychic and be told like, I don't know, you need another job or something like, oh, gr- <laughs> great opportunity will be bestowed upon you. I'm like, really interesting. I'm going to get a job offer. <laughs> go ask for that raise. Boss, I quit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but uh, still with the company, by the way. <laughs> um, and that was not what was said in the uh, in in the in the tarot thing, but it's it's fun, uh, and I do believe it's helped me each time. Uh, maybe more emotionally, or like understanding the stored potential for something to occur. It's very important to open one up uh, oneself up to those energies. I think going off of that though, too, I, I and I think we see this with both Hermione and McGonagall specifically. It's when it's not written down in a textbook or it hasn't been studied to a certain extent, there's this tendency, and we do it in our own lives, it's easy to be dismissive of what we don't understand. Yeah. And I think that Trelawney, if we're to look at her predictions in this first chapter where we meet her, it's all about nuance, sure, but there's clearly something there because we're told that she's a descendant of the great Cassandra Trelawney. And if you're to study Greek mythology, Cassandra was a priestess and she served Apollo, but all these prophecies that she gave, nobody believed her. And so I think that says so much about Trelawney as a character is that she could be out here putting the truth in front of everybody, but nobody really at the end of the day believes what she has to say, even those that are teaching alongside of her at Hogwarts. 
I, I think there's a lot to talk about as it relates particularly to both Hermione and McGonagall's opinion of Trelawney. I have a question for you, Micah, kind of related to that. Do you think that part of people's interpretations of Trelawney, the the lack of seriousness with which she and her craft are treated is because of her potentially coming across as incompetent or kind of dotty um, up in the clouds, not really in touch with the rest of us mere mortals. Um, <laughs> do we think that that might have something to do with it? If she presented a more competent facade, would people maybe take her a little more seriously? I think so. I, I think if she were to teach, like, let's say, Professor McGonagall, it's likely that certain students would be more willing to believe in what it is she is teaching. And I'm thinking back to the Hogwarts Legacy game. There's a really great divination professor, and apologize because I'm forgetting her name right now. Uh, if she was teaching, I think that students would be more likely to believe her as well. I just think, though, that e even Trelawney says that she doesn't venture out much from her classroom. Uh, she's She's not really a you know a social butterfly um however like i don't know I, i've always found those professors who are kind of the most quirky to be the most interesting and the ones you're likely to learn the most from uh, but I, but i think there's there's a lot to pick apart as it relates to trelawney because we know it doesn't come into play i think in this chapter but certainly in future chapters and in future books She's got a bit of a drinking problem, <laughs> which which clearly well, the Hogwarts yeah. staff, uh, you know, is it's not an uncommon problem as we see later right. on in this chapter. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, that's a good point. I think she's lonely. Mm. I think she's an outcast. I think that because of the way the other teachers feel about her, look, it's twofold. Some of it's her fault. Some of it's not. She grossly underestimates the impact that her words have on students. The idea that she would predict in the opening class that one of them will die this year, even <laughs> if it's able to be dismissed uh, by other teachers and lucky that it was or Harry would be feeling very awful. You just can't say that to people. You can't like she's putting on a uh, this big show to make it seem to get people interested in her subject. But it's a misunderstanding of her own power as a teacher to think that she could actually just get away with doing that. And it wouldn't have serious psychological side effects on these kids. Yeah. And, and the fact that we find out it happens every year, McGonagall tells the class that <laughs> a little bit later when they're all kind of down in the dumps, she literally transfigures into her cat animagus form and gets no reaction from the class. I love that little McGonagall moment <laughs> of like, okay, okay, usually when I do that, people clap. What's going people on? People love that party trick. Yeah, what's it's wrong? like, what's wrong with you guys? And then it's it's like, well, we just had our first divination class. And she's like, ah, say no more. I get it. Seems like something Dumbledore should talk to Trelawney about. Maybe, you know, rein back the death predictions, especially in the first class. Andrew, I'm glad you brought up Dumbledore, though. Uh, and uh oh, I'm no. sure we're going to talk about this a little bit later on when we talk about Hagrid. But, you know, if you're to take the other side of the, the argument as it relates to Trelawney, is she really qualified to be teaching at Hogwarts? We later learn she's there for protection, and, and that's the primary reason why she's in this post. But certainly there are other professors other options that are available to him to hire into this post. I mean, that ends up happening in, what is it? Is it Order of the Phoenix or Half-Blood Prince where Ferenz ends up stepping in yeah. to yep. teach divination? Order of the Phoenix. Yeah. So there's a connecting the threads right there between these books. And let's not forget how Hermione treats him as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, she Hermione is very quick to write off this subject matter because it's just not something that she sees any merit in. And I think, you know, to Eric's point, to an extent, you can see why based off of this first class. I know if I walked into a class like this, 
Uh, my immediate impression would be like, okay, this is a bunch of bull. Um, I'm probably dropping this class. But to the other points that have been raised, Trelawney has had her moments. And I think it just goes to show that, um, you know, we are very quick to write people off across the board on the basis of how they present um, and on the basis of them being wrong sometimes. Being wrong sometimes doesn't mean you're wrong all the time. I thought it was interesting too. There was like a little connection here with how women interact with each other in this series, particularly when they don't care for each other. And I wanted to highlight that Professor Trelawney has those pink teacups that she says she's very partial to. We know that the author does not like the color pink and tends to assign the color pink or stereotypically feminine things to female characters that are not intended to be well liked by the reader. And we see, you know, the way that characters like Hermione and McGonagall react to Trelawney, that kind of acted out in real time in this chapter. That, that connection is very interesting to me. Yeah. Can I also jump back to the lavender prediction? Sure. Um, so speaking of lavender predictions and, and foreshadowing in this class that we're talking about, Trelawney at one point asks Lavender to pass a silver teapot and Lavender agrees and it's noted she stood up to pick it up. And what that made me think about, because Lavender, of course, dies later in the series, in Order of the Phoenix, we get the line from Trelawney that when there's 13 people dining together, the first to rise is the first to die. And of course, that ended up being true. So I don't know if there's something there, but I found it interesting that she has that line uh, in Order of the Phoenix. And then you look back here and Lavender stands up and she does die later on. I don't know. Maybe it was just a coincidence, but there's definitely examples like so, for instance, everything that Ron ever predicts in this class comes 100 percent true. <laughs> like, yes, yeah. there's some really weird, cool plotting things that absolutely happen. So the subject is not bad at all. In fact, it's it's used, I think, in, in the perfect way to tell the story. Um, it's just the teacher teaching it is insufferable. So are we just <laughs> going to the fun of this? It's like yeah, she's, yeah, yeah. she's nuts, but some of the stuff in this chapter does actually end up coming true or, or later in the series. Cause that can be true. regardless, you can have teachers that aren't the greatest teachers, but still get something out of the subject. Like right. yeah. a, a better teacher would do better at it. But I think that there's still like the subject itself is interesting enough. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Am I right? right twice a day. <laughs> right. Which that's how many times Trelawney has been right twice. Well, um, <laughs> the the point about simple. Ron though, I feel like is meant, to delegitimize Trelawney. The mm. fact that he, in a joking manner, gets so many of these things right is meant to delegitimize divination. I'll take another angle to it, which is it's just He's good. that Ron. Ron's a seer. Well, Ron's a seer. <laughs> Uh, Ron is Dumbledore from the future. A smart character. Uh, a sp <laughs> Ron Weasley, a true gifted seer. No, it's 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 literally between the cracks. Ron is not expecting it to yield tremendous, uh, amazing results. So his read of it is not colored by his expectation. His base most level of reading it is exactly how you're supposed like to that. read the tea leaves. That's what I'm saying. So so it's he's right, not because he's a seer or not because he it's just because he's not um, biased by the expectation. And so what he says ends up being the most right. Yeah, I also think that it's it's a little bit of projection of what he wants. You know, he says um, you're going to go on to work for the Ministry of Magic. You're going to have a windfall of unexpected gold. Both of those things happens. happen. And those are things that he wants. He wants good things for his friend. And Ron is also someone who himself would love to get a windfall of unexpected gold so is is Ron manifesting here? And I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but it, and I'm not saying that Ron is predicting the future here, but in sort of highlighting his wants for his friend, I think it, it goes to speak to how well Ron knows Harry because he knows, yeah, you're capable and qualified. You probably could work for the ministry. So it's a safe guess to make. 
Um, and then, you know, Harry already has a lot of gold and may well go on to do things that will bring more gold his way. So it feels like Ron is making some pretty easy predictions here that I think anyone who knows Harry very well could make. Definitely. Yeah. I guess the thing that makes me impressed by this is that all three of these things are right. Like you mentioned, work for the Ministry of Magic, unexpected gold windfall, and also he sees an animal in the teacup and he says it's a hippogriff or a sheep. Later in that chapter, he encounters a hippogriff. So, yeah, there is I mean, hippogriff. that one, it, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, I'm impressed. Well, <laughs> there's also the mention of a bowler hat, right? And mm. that's what Ron ends up connecting to the Ministry. But what if we're to look at it from the standpoint of Fudge, who we know wears bowler hats and being a threat to Harry, we know he's Mm. kind of his buddy buddy in this book, but in future books, he ends up being uh, an enemy. I like that a lot. And Trelawney does mention having a deadly enemy. (laughs) <laughs> right well everyone Every- knows that <laughs> everyone looks at Hermione say, well they do <laughs> it's like perfect yeah and actually in this book again it goes back to the theme of the ministry being wrong about who Harry's enemy is in this story it's very interesting well let's talk about Hermione and McGonagall's reactions to divination here quickly do we think that Hermione was too quick to judge Ron points out you just don't like being bad at something for a change. And he really touches a nerve with that one. Yeah. Ron pointing that out makes it worse. Actually. I th- I think there's an element of that. I love that Ron can clue into that because it very clearly is a thing that Hermione is doing. But I think that Hermione is predisposed not to like this because it's not going to immediately be her strong suit. But I think that even all of the critics of divination like Hermione, like McGonagall, really could benefit if they just give it more of a chance than they're predisposed to. Yeah, I I agree with that. I also feel like McGonagall and Hermione are similar people. And it's interesting, but not surprising that they have similar feelings towards Trelawney. And I'm also thinking perhaps McGonagall had already warned Hermione about Trelawney and her being a little wild since yeah. we know they had already previously met about Hermione's course load. So it it's not a big stretch to assume they touched on divination a bit and Hermione entered this class already hearing McGonagall being very uh, tired of Trelawney. <laughs> so I think she kind of already went in with a bias that she picked up from McGonagall. And then you mix that in with what Ron is saying and Hermione just has a bunch of different problems with there's this also class a and very, this teacher. There's also a very science versus faith argument to be based here. Uh, Hermione deals in facts, what can be measured. And this divination thing is imprecise. It's faith. You got to believe in the energies. You got to believe what you're seeing will come true uh, or it doesn't mean anything. And that's and Hermione just can't literally different type of person. Yeah. And she's going into the skeptical. So she can't believe like you're saying and trelawney says as much in the class right basically from the start that you're not really going to have success off of what you read in a book it's going to be what you believe in and what you're able to put into practice and and so i i think like that it's certainly possible, Andrew, that McGonagall talked with her beforehand, but I do think like that moment was the moment that Hermione realized that maybe she's not going to do that well in this class. Also think that what, one thing that we're ignoring in all of this too is Hermione could be really stressed out, right? She's taking three classes at the exact same time and who knows like what order she's taking them in. She could have <laughs> just come from those two other classes to sit down in divination and she's just overwhelmed by what's going on I, you know i yeah, and, and so she she doesn't want to have any what she doesn't want to have any of what trelawney is putting out there yeah very true it could be that she feels like she's come from a more rigorous class and is walking into something that she sees as being you know she describes it as woolly right so um uh, what is know. that word i was surprised to see that uh actually made it to the u.s edition that i'm reading because i don't I've never heard anybody use "woolly" in a sentence, like fluffy, like yeah, empty. Like how do, what does that mean for an expression? Like 
Like it's like it's not it's not substantive, I think is okay. what it means. Confused in expression or character. Okay, confused. Yeah, I was just like I thought the um the translators of the British to English uh terms uh only took the day off starting in like book four or five, but <laughs> that one first and last time I've ever heard someone described as woolly. I'm woolly thinking about woolly. <laughs> Okay, well, wrapping things up on divination and on Trelawney, she, of course, uh, stuns the class when she says that she sees the grim at the bottom of Harry's teacup. So I thought we could talk a little bit about grim folklore. Would someone like to read this uh, little paragraph we have here with some background on the grim and its uh, inspiration? Micah, Micah, Micah. <laughs> I knew that was Mike. coming. Yeah, <laughs> Micah, right. give the people what they want. <laughs> All right. The black dog is a supernatural, spectral, or demonic entity originating from English folklore that has also been seen throughout Europe and the Americas. It is usually unnaturally large with glowing red or yellow eyes, it is often connected with the devil as an English incarnation of the hellhound and is sometimes an omen of death. The origins of the black dog are difficult to discern. It is uncertain whether the creature originated in the Celtic or Germanic elements of British culture. Throughout European mythology, dogs have been associated with death. This association seems to be due to the scavenging habits of dogs. It is possible that the black dog is a survival of these beliefs. Thank you. And we know that there's also a lot of superstition surrounding black cats, right? And what they can mean too. Um, and we know that in the real world, black dogs and black cats um, are often not the most sought of or after. It's, um, it can be kind of hard to get black dogs and black cats adopted out, probably because of these kinds of superstitions that have been passed down over thousands of years. Um, so really interesting to see where the inspiration for the Grimm comes in and kind of understand that it's it's deeper than just Harry Potter. And I think subconsciously we all know that culturally there is sort of a superstition around, um, you know, black dogs and black cats. But I think it's interesting that we don't see as much of this represented in the wizarding world for cats. Do we ever get this in the series? Um, I I probably not think so. I think, I mean, that might be one of the things that JK Rowling was trying to steer clear of as being, you know, something that we hear so often about in the muggle world that they're really worth putting it into the story. Yeah, It's always interesting reading about this because when I was younger uh, and I, I read some of the Sherlock Holmes stories. There's one called The Case of the Hound of the Baskervilles. And this plays very much into that storyline as well. This, you know, these kind of this supernatural hellhound that's out there on the moor doing terrible things. And and I guess maybe that's more of a European thing than it is a, a US thing. We're we're more on cats, honestly, than than dogs. Yeah. Maybe maybe we're just bigger dog lovers. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I find it interesting that the description of the Grimm says churchyards, too. That there there is something religious about the origin and about death omens. It just fits right in with the overall theme of the chapter about what is uh, what cannot be seen or examined directly. All right. Well, we will take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk about Hagrid's first class. All right, let's talk about Hagrid's first class. Yeah, uh, this discussion is uh, otherwise titled (laughs) Bleep Around and Find Out. (laughs) So Hagrid's inaugural Care of Magical Creatures class features hippogriffs, um, which is a reminder that Hagrid's heart is in the right place, but his judgment isn't always the best. Oh, Laura, I will hear no bad things against Hagrid in this chapter. The first thing out of his word is out of his mouth is a warning. 
It is. That's true. But these, don't we later learn that hippogriffs are, in terms of magical creatures, they're more of a fifth year yeah. topic. This is yeah. very advanced for third years, but we know that it's because Hagrid wants his first class to be a hit. He really wants to he wants to engage with these students. He wants them to be as excited as he is. And starting with flobber worms ain't going to do it. So <laughs> that's why he does what he does. Well, can, um, can I ask a question, though? What yeah. do we think the reaction would have been if he had started with something like flobber worms? He probably would have still gotten a level of flack from, yeah. from the students because they would say, oh, this, like, this is what we're studying. This guy mm-hmm. doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, he's damned if he does, damned if he doesn't, you know, unfortunately. He also wrongly assumes that the class is going to share his sense of humor about the Monster Book of Monsters, (laughs) um, which is a really embarrassing moment for him. We see that it really um, sets things off on the wrong foot. He's very nervous to begin with, which probably doesn't help. Um, You know, I think We've all been, we've all had pets either now or at some point. And I think we all know that if you are nervous and you're exuding nervous energy, it's going to have an impact on your animals. So that could also kind of be setting the tone for maybe the hippogriffs being a little on edge in this chapter because Hagrid's on edge. Yeah, interesting. That's fair. And even though we have the words written out uh, of what Hagrid says, warning everyone that they're very proud creatures, you should never insult them. It could be the last thing you ever do. If Hagrid's nervous, we don't know how fast he's saying this. We don't know if his diction is good. Maybe. I I know Draco is actively not listening, but it's possible students who are listening can't hear Hagrid if he's mumbling his words or if he's... And these are the things that being a seasoned teacher would help you with is is that kind of understanding to grab everyone's attention to make sure that when you're giving a warning, everyone is listening. In fact, he could have scolded or or, or told Draco, hey, this is actually very important, Mr. Malfoy, you know, like that kind of thing. Yeah, he has that authority as a, as a professor. Think about how Snape treats the students sometimes. But uh, I, I actually, I don't disagree with some of the things that Draco says when it it's related to the to the monster book of monsters because I don't think that he's wrong. Maybe his delivery is not the best, but I, I don't I don't disagree with him. Um, but to me, this has always been a, a bad move by Dumbledore. Hagrid should have been a teacher's assistant before being made a full blown professor. There are likely classes that Hagrid could have taken to prepare him for this role. And I think Dumbledore is setting him up for failure from the start. Wow. Did he sit down with Hagrid to review the course work before the term started? Maybe you would have avoided having hippogriffs uh, as the first lesson. And it also made me wonder, is there honestly nobody that's more qualified to teach at Hogwarts in this role? Newt Scamander came to mind. I'm sure there's plenty of other wizards and witches who know this material. And the fact that he promoted Hagrid to this role just shows sometimes he put his his heart before his head. And I'm talking about Dumbledore. And, And I just think that at the end of the day, Dumbledore is responsible here for what happens. He's responsible as a headmaster for hiring all the professors that teach at the school and how their classes go. Um, I would I would actually ask the same question about Lupin too. Like, does he sit down and review what Defense Against the Dark Arts is going to look like? Lupin's never been in front of a classroom before. How does he know that this man is qualified to teach? So there's a lot of questions here about Dumbledore's decision making, and I I really do believe that he's not setting up Hagrid for success. Yeah, you're right. I like yeah. this reading of it. I like the reading of it being Hagrid was not given the resources that he needed to be successful as a professor, as opposed to, oh, Hagrid's just unqualified and shouldn't be allowed to do this. I agree. I think that he he has the natural talent to be able to teach a class like this, but he's not given any of the tools to be able to do it, even to Eric's earlier point about, you know, having the classroom management 
prowess to be able to say, hey, Malfoy, you need to shut up and pay attention. Hagrid isn't given any of that empowerment by Dumbledore. So I think this is a, this is a failing that we can hang on Dumbledore to. The buck stops there. <laughs> Andrew, do you have anything to say for yourself, a.k.a. Andrew's Dumbledore? The, the buck really <laughs> does stop there. The buck stops there. The buck beak stops there. I ah. think... I, look, um, I think I agree with the points that are being raised. I think I've said this on the show before, and I'll say it again. Things are loosey-goosey at Hogwarts. That's how Dumbledore runs things, okay? He likes a little <laughs> unpredictability happening around the school and, and letting these teachers have free reign and the students, to some extent, have free reign. Um, I guess he's a bit of a gambler. I would like to think that Dumbledore and Hagrid did sit down. For maybe one meeting to talk through what being a teacher is like. And Rubius is like, oh, for my first lesson with with Harry and company, I'll do uh, hippogriffs. And Dumbledore was like, ooh, that sounds that sounds kind of fun. OK, sure. Maybe encouraging it. Maybe he trusts. Maybe he just trusts Hagrid that much. You can see this as a commentary on how much he trusts him. And certainly Hagrid has seniority at the school. It's better. I. Yes, Newt's commander would have been a good choice for this, assuming he would be up for it. But Rubius has also been at the school. And I think Hagrid really wanted this role. So you combine the seniority with his interest in the role. I think that's that's a good combination for giving somebody a chance. He's not doing any great favors for Hagrid, though. I think that I think that Dumbledore's smart enough to know that this is going to be disastrous in one way or the other. He might not have known that a student would have gotten attacked and then made a big deal of it for the entire school year. But uh, Dumbledore probably well, just on, filled though. his position. No, no, no. Like Kettleburn probably was like, "I'm out. <laughs> I have bar- yeah. barely few." And Dumbledore's like, "Man, I'm still struggling for the DADA position. I can't deal with this. Let's just let the groundskeeper do it." Like, let's just put Hagrid there. He knows the subject, which Hagrid does. Nobody knows it better, but he's not a good teacher. And this was always going to happen. Okay, but but this was Draco's fault. He insulted the hippogriff. Sure, I guess Hagrid could have seen this coming, maybe. But I would put most of the blame on Draco here, not Hagrid. Oh, I would. I think we would all blame Draco first. But as a teacher, you also have to prevent against the possibility that a student will get hurt at, like yeah. by their own fault. Like you have to you have to create to truly create a safe space. You got to predict the unpredictable. Every parent knows this. Every teacher knows this. Yeah. And teachers have to have contingency plans in place for any lesson plan that they want to lead in their classroom. They have to be prepared to Eric's point for the unexpected, or they have to be prepared to pivot when need be. The contingency was Pomfrey can take care of this. If somebody can seriously <laughs> hurt. That's the contingency. We have a nurse. That's what Harry's basically said too. And it's, it's not wrong. <laughs> That's I true. think, yeah. And I see the Mela brought this up in the discord and it's actually what i was just going to say wouldn't any 13 year old mess around with an animal I, I, within a group <laughs> like this th- the likelihood of that happening has to be pretty high and so yeah you can place blame with draco but it, this also goes back to what we talked about with dumbledore sitting down with hagrid and saying look hagrid for your first lesson take it easy like you know easy to safe. things don't bring in hippogriffs where you have the potential for something <laughs> like this to happen um I, I you know i do feel bad for hagrid because I, I i feel like he was put in a very difficult situation is he qualified it depends on what the qualifications are for this for this role we don't really know right this is the first time that we're seeing this class uh being taught but i i do like the idea of of a newt scamander um, we know that from the Prisoner of Azkaban movie, he was on the Marauders map in in the end scene. So clearly, he was visiting right. Hogwarts <laughs> in in Harry's third year. But one other thing I'll just say about this, uh, with introducing a new professor, is that you know with Hagrid, Draco already knows Hagrid, and Draco knows the buttons he can push, and the way he can treat Hagrid is probably not the same way he can treat somebody like Lupin, who he's meeting for the first time. Um, Draco's had two years of experience of Hagrid already. 
one of which his father sent Hagrid to Azkaban for doing something he didn't do. So mm. I just feel like you already have that built-in relationship there. And, you know, he's coming to the class with preconceived notions about Hagrid and how he can treat him. Yeah, everything about this is just in bad faith. Everything that Draco continues to do. And Hagrid should have been a little bit more prepared for Draco specifically. Um, Draco and Hagrid have not seen eye to eye ever since Draco turned in uh, Hagrid for the dragon in year one. So if you know that this is going to be your pupil, you got and and knowing that his greatest rival, Harry Potter, is going to be in the same class, you got to take more attention or more care to or somebody should have helped Hagrid to point out that you got to really like worry about the students that's almost more important than the than whatever you're teaching in class is figuring out how to manage a classroom of people yeah and you know focusing on draco here for a moment he is definitely pulling the you know wait till my father hears about this line um that he loves to pull but he's also referring to hagrid as that great oaf and it makes me wonder if at this point in time does someone like a Draco Malfoy make assumptions about Hagrid's um, roots, about Hagrid's background? Because Hagrid visibly, he's visually, he he's much larger than the average Witcher wizard. You have to think that there are rumors or suspicions at this point that Hagrid might be mixed with something be it a giant or something else and it makes me wonder if there's this low-key discrimination that's already happening at this point in the series and even might have been happening and might have been why Hagrid was such an easy target um to to be the one who was sort of scapegoated for opening the chamber of secrets in the first place because there's this assumption that he's an oaf he's dumb absolutely yeah he's yeah. he's easy to set up and I can't learn anything from him. That's the worst mistake you make as a student. If you don't have faith in your teachers believing that you can't learn anything from them, well, then you're not going to. Yeah. And, you know, my position on this whole incident is that this is a school of magic and magical creatures and shit happens. Like if Draco was Lucy injured Goosey. in Quidditch, would Madame Hooch be on the hook? I don't think so. And I would just say, like, as we go through the series and we hear about all the crazy things that happen in other classes, they don't result in the professor getting in trouble, right? So I this goes to your point, Laura. I think Hagrid is just an easy target. And he, I think Draco also realizes that there's a deep connection between Hagrid and Harry, and so that he can get to Harry by going through Hagrid and we see that happen when he goes to his dad and I also I just hate people who are like I'm gonna tell my daddy about you know like <laughs> yeah yeah we've all known at least one well then Hagrid brings in the hippogriffs so let's get into some hippogriff origin here um, the hippogriff is a legendary creature with the front half of an eagle and the hind half of a horse. It was invented at the beginning of the 16th century by Ludovico Aristo in his poem Orlando Furioso. Within the poem, the hippogriff is a steed born of a mare and a griffin, something considered impossible. It is extremely fast and is presented as being able to fly around the world and to the moon. Notably in the poem, um, the hippogriff is also used to rescue a character that is imprisoned. Very interesting because this is what Buckbeak is used for later in yeah. this book. Good call out. And I did feel like Harry purposely volunteered to approach the hippogriff first because, yes, he is brave in general. He is a Gryffindor, after all. But he is also trying to test this prediction about his death, right? After hearing about the Grimm yes, earlier in the chapter. That's exactly it. Yes. Mm. And that's why, look, in the movie, it's funny that the whole class backs away. And, and Harry, so Harry is not actually choosing to step forward. Hagrid only thinks that Harry's there to support him. 
But in the books, it's very much to say no to death. It's very much to like disprove what everyone's saying about him. And so I think that that's an important moment for Harry stepping forward that you call that, Andrew. I love that. Well, Hagrid cautions Harry not to blink, which I find very interesting. He says it's because hippogriffs don't trust too much blinking. And I wanted to dig into this a little bit. There is scientific research into what blinking behavior says about trustworthiness. Um, Something that I found through psychology today is that apparently slow blinking at your cat tells them that you love them. So for all of you uh, cat uh, pet parents out there, there's a tip. But also the National Institutes of Health did a study where they found that false intent was linked with changes to blinking measures specifically around if you were lying about things that you had done in the past or if you were lying about things that you had intended for the future, that your blinking behavior would actually increase. I thought this was interesting because in thinking about what triggers Buckbeak to attack Draco, we know it's because hippogriffs are proud creatures. Draco starts insulting Buckbeak. But are we really led to believe that Buckbeak can understand English? Or is there something... Mm. Um, is there something deeper and sort of more related to, you know, body movements, gestures, or Tone. even Draco's blinking that might have triggered this to happen? It's that classic question of does your cat know their name? Yeah. Or does your dog know their name? Or are they just responding to your voice and the intonation? Right. Kind of something to think about. But this is fascinating, Laura. I love this. Yeah, yeah I, like I think it's it's made clear that it's very important you set up a certain trust between you and the hippogriff. So I can see the blinking actually being very important here. And um, the second point, the the false intent link with changes to blinking measures, I absolutely uh, think that's a real thing here when it comes to your relationship with the hippogriff. Well, it is I- interesting because Draco does get Buckbeak to bow to him, and it's only when he starts petting him that he starts insulting Buckbeak and that's when the attack happens. So it's like he yeah, tricked him. <laughs> I, I like to think that there's a certain level of sentience here that that Buckbeak can actually... I mean, Hagrid says they're very proud creatures. And so I, I maybe it's going back to what you were just talking, maybe it's the intonation in his voice, the way that he's speaking that causes Buckbeak to react the way that he does. Maybe Buckbeak doesn't fully understand what he's saying, but he can tell the just by what he the the, the tone of his voice that what he's saying is not good, <laughs> and so that yeah. causes Buckbeak to react the way that he does. Yeah, well, your pets can tell how you're feeling towards them based on the tone of your voice, right? Like my dog can tell when I'm mad at her, for example. She doesn't maybe know what I'm saying or what I'm mad about. But she can tell if I'm upset, um, you know, same as she can tell when I'm really happy or when I'm really excited. Eric, I don't know how this translates to cats. I feel like cats um, are maybe a little more independent <laughs> than dogs. Oh, they, they can tell when you're upset at them. They just don't care. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that's the thing. I've literally I will shout and be like, no, Martha down. <laughs> She'll like still do the thing. It's like it's she just looks at you and slow blinks. She's like, I love like, you, dad. <laughs> I acknowledge that you were upset with me. I will not desist from my present course of action. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering, though, too, right with I think I think it's actually mentioned that Hagrid brings out 12 hippogriffs. So there's the number 12 again. Mm. And that that wasn't my point, though. <laughs> um are there too many hippogriffs? Like, yeah, I, you know, maybe, a lot. maybe I'm thinking about, and, and this is jumping ahead to the next chapter, but when Lupin does the Boggart in the wardrobe, it's one by one. It's not a lineup of wardrobes fill of, filled with Boggarts in it. And so perhaps just using Buckbeak to go from one student to the next would have been the better method of teaching in this case, as opposed to letting a bunch of 13-year-olds just hang around beasts that he said from the start, you know, could get violent. And and so this goes to his ability to teach and 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 you know, again, like 
The other thing is he takes this too far, right? It's not just bow to the hippogriff, pet the hippogriff. He literally puts Harry on, or no, Harry gets onto the hippogriff himself. Sorry, I was thinking of the movie and and flies around. Like that could have been really dangerous to Harry. He said he's got no place to hold on to. He could have fallen off at any time. He could have broken something upon landing. So again, Hagrid doesn't know how to like ease people yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great yeah. point about Harry flying. Starting to sound like a security <laughs> nightmare. There security it is. Nightmare. We brought it back. I love that. <laughs> uh, yeah, first time a- for book three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. It is a great point, though. And I think it's another example of Hagrid really trying to make his first class just like a winner right out of the gate. He wants these kids to walk away and be like, whoa, Care of Magical Creatures is such a yeah. cool class. Yep. That's really where his head is at. And it's not where it should be if he wants to be a teacher. I wanted to ask as we wrap this chapter up, we obviously know Draco gets attacked by Buckbeak, um, leaves a nasty gash in his arm, ends up having to go to the hospital wing, has to be mended by Madame Pomfrey. And he's going to proceed for quite a while now to really milk this for all it's worth. Um, He wants to make it seem as though he is more gravely injured than he actually is. He's saying that the hippogriff has killed him. um, And ultimately, he's going to, you know, like wince and moan about his injury for quite a while. All of that said, do we think it's a good thing that this happened to Draco? Did he kind of have this coming to him? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good thing because at the start of this chapter, he's making fun of Harry for being weak. And then he's being weak here, even though he's faking it. So now Harry could use this against Draco, even if he is faking it. So, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Uh, Yeah, it's important to have a a respect for the subject that you're taking, especially when those things can do damage to you. You should have, I think, a healthy fear uh, as it pertains to something otherworldly like a magical beast, just so that you treat them with as much care as the subject implies. Get a little uncomfortable. Yeah, Yeah, it would have been great if if Harry used this against Draco now. Yeah. He wouldn't, though, because he knows Hagrid's in deep sh- That's that's the, yeah. That's the problem, is having this ammo, but not being able to use it. Yeah. And we know that, that Draco can and ultimately does complain to his dad, which sets off the entire arc of Hagrid's plot of this book and, and makes his life really miserable this year. Mm-hmm. I think so that's why. As we look to what the students are doing, like the other Slytherin students later to this, like later this day, um, when they get to dinner, the students, the Slytherins are already calling for Hagrid to be removed immediately. And there's already been several conversations. Madame Pomfrey fixed Malfoy and her estimation is that the boy is totally cool to go, like good to go. She would know. And Hagrid or Harry says, yeah, she regrew my bones in a night. Like there's nothing she can't do, but everyone is calling for Hagrid's expulsion. Reminds me of kind of like what maybe like a woke mob does or <laughs> what cancel like people are outraged and now there need to be consequences, but the arguments in bad faith. So it's like, what do you do about this? Yeah. Oh my God, it's Hogwarts cancel culture. Oh, <laughs> Hagrid's but- canceled. Yeah, well, and Hagrid really does feel like he's canceled. The trio go down to visit him in his cabin later on in the evening, and he's drunk, as was mentioned earlier on in the chapter, and he's lamenting. He's he's like, it must be a record. Like, I don't think that we've ever had a professor get sacked this quickly. And they're like, well, you haven't been, right? And he's like, no, but I'm I, I'm guessing that... <laughs> Soon, it's probably coming. We know that reminds me of the kids thinking they're going to be expelled. Yeah, just assuming Hagrid thinking he's going to be sacked. Oh no! Well, and the sad thing here is too, there is a connecting the threads moment. We know that in Order of the Phoenix, Hagrid does get replaced by Professor Grubbly Plank, and if we're talking about a professor who maybe exudes more competence as you know somebody with teaching abilities, she is it, right? Um, And they kind of struggle with that because they do have to acknowledge in book five that she is a good teacher and she is managing the class maybe a little better than Hagrid does. Um, But Hagrid, you know, he gets himself together at Hermione's urging and ultimately remembers, oh my God, 
there's a mass murderer out on the loose looking for Harry. You guys got to get back up to the castle. Don't ever let me catch you out after dark again. (laughs) And that is where our chapter leaves us. Very comical. I had forgotten it ends that way. Very sudden change of heart from Hagrid. It it was funny. As soon as he sobers up, he's like, you guys aren't safe here. Yeah. Yeah, he stops. I mean, he goes from throwing himself a little pity party to being like, oh, my God, Harry Potter's in danger. (laughs) This is the priority. We're going to get into some odds and ends here. Of course, we already touched on McGonagall turning into her tabby cat form in Transfiguration. It's the first time we see this since uh, Sorcerer's Stone. So welcome back. Um, Ron also points out to Hermione when he's looking at her course schedule that there isn't enough time for her course load. It's very pointed. It's uh-huh. it's italicized when he says it and everything. Hermione, there's not enough time. Uh-huh. So it's it's very clear, sort of from the vantage point of knowing what happens in this book. Yeah. How the setup is happening here. Just to go back to the Animagus point for a second, uh, I thought it was interesting that they aren't paying attention to this particular lesson because it does play <laughs> such a pivotal role in Prisoner of Azkaban. And I Classic. think as oh. a reader, you're also meant to not pay attention to the fact that this particular lesson is on Animagi. So That's a great point, Micah, as evidenced by the fact that it it kind of comes up as an aside for this chapter, right? Like, oh, she turns into her tabby cat form. Cool, let's keep it moving. But actually, it's really important. And it makes a whole lot of sense when you think about the fact they're learning about, you know, animagus or animagi in their third year. Is that when the marauders would have started working on becoming animagi themselves? I think so because it takes yeah. it takes them like two years, right, to do it. Yeah, interesting. Also, just wanted to call out that Sir Cadigan helps them find Trelawney's classroom, and in light of this forthcoming Harry Potter TV series, I just want to say Max that. Little moments like these are what we should see in the TV series. So let's get that maxed. And and I think as we continue going through these books, we need to call out more of these little moments we would like to see adapted for television. Agreed. He did appear in two Prisoner of Azkaban deleted scenes from the movie uh, while he defended Gryffindor Tower. So they almost got him in, but they didn't. And then one thing I wanted to mention too, and this may be a bit of a stretch, but at the start of the chapter, it's mentioned uh, the trio see Hagrid entering the Great Hall, swinging a pole cat, a dead pole cat from his hand. Um, And a pole cat very much looks like a ferret, if listeners don't know. Uh, Ah. And I, I was drawing some connections maybe to the end of the chapter when Hagrid's carrying Draco up to the school. And we know that Draco gets turned into a ferret in the next book. I don't know. Like, maybe that's too much of a stretch, but I did think that was kind of interesting. I'll allow it. I like it. (laughs) I'll allow it. (laughs) All right. Let's move to MVP of the week. And I'm going to give it to Harry James Potter for dealing with predictions of his death. That's tough. But then bravely being the first to meet a hippogriff. Well done, my boy. I'm going to give it to the pony in Sir Cadigan's painting, who may or may not have thrown him off anyway. Just had enough of that man. Yeah, I can't blame him for that. Uh, I'm going to give it to Buckbeak. Honestly, Draco had that coming. He he messed around and he found out. He only has himself to blame. And I'm going to give it to Ron for being the best seer of the 20th century. <laughs> okay. If you have any feedback about today's episode or the chapters ahead, send an owl to mugglecast at gmail.com or use that contact form on mugglecast.com. You can also send a voice message. Just record it using the voice memo app on your phone and then email us that file. Or you can use our phone number, which is 192033Muggle. That's 192036844453. Next week's episode will be a Muggle Mail episode. So send in that feedback now. Smoke them if you got them. And we might read your feedback in episode 609. Very nice. 
Now it's time for Quizage. Last week's question was, who guides the trio to their first divination class? We just talked about him. This was the knight in the painting, Sir Cadogan. Or Cadogan. Or Cadogan. Actually, I think every audiobook person has read this differently. <laughs> um, so whatever you say in your head feels right, that's right. Correct answers were submitted by uh, some fun named people, including Dirk Dirk Boing, Jeffendor, Daniel Radquiz, Deep Cover Aurer, Cajun Gryffindor, Bagels for Buckbeak, Call Me Neville, mm. Head Girls from Gryffindor, your local Irish leprechaun, Sir Candungus Fletcher, Rainbow Drizzle, Armoonie, Kaladin Stormblast, Don't Be a Jigglypuff, Noah the Ravenclaw, and Ravenclaw Kid. Uh, so congratulations to everyone. Here is next week's Quizage question. What form does Parvati Patil's Bogart take? We got a really good chapter ahead of us next week or the week after next, actually. It's not Ron, is it? Uh, it's not Ron or nor any red haired <laughs> man that we can tell. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> Submit your answer to us on the Quidditch Quizich form uh, on the MuggleCast website, MuggleCast.com slash Quizich, or click Quizich from the main nav. Coming up in bonus MuggleCast, just a quick reminder once more, we will be discussing this new Quidditch game that was recently announced. So that'll be available over on our Patreon. Yeah, speaking of bonus MuggleCast, this episode is supported by muggles like you. There's much more MuggleCast waiting for you on Patreon. Uh, Last time I counted, it was over 50 hours of content. Uh, of just bonus MuggleCast over the last seven years. Pledge now at patreon.com slash MuggleCast to receive instant access to ad-free MuggleCast, the chance to co-host the show, monthly Zoom hangouts, physical gifts, and much, much more. And if you're an Apple Podcast user for just $2.99 a month, you can receive ad-free and early access to MuggleCast right within the Apple Podcast app. Patreon offers more benefits, but we know some people might prefer supporting us via Apple. Just tap into the show and you'll see the subscribe button. And don't forget to follow us on social media. Our username is MuggleCast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And last but not least, make sure you're following MuggleCast for free in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And leave us a five-star review if you're enjoying the show and your app allows you to review it. So that concludes episode 608. Thanks everybody for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.